two, three. Welcome to another episode of Silk and Steel Podcast. I'm your host, Carl Zha. Today, we like to welcome our returning guest, Xiang Yu, a Taiwanese communist rapper who had been uh, our guest on our recurring series on Taiwan's political development. Uh, welcome to our show, um, Xiang Yu. Hey, Carl. Good to be back. Did you say development uh, or devolvement? Whatever, man. Same thing. <laughs> potato, potato. <laughs> In ESL, baby. <laughs> In ESL. Uh, okay, what, I'm saying, so, what I'm saying is development and development both work. Yes. So what? Um, so last time we left off, we talked about, uh, you know, we, we started the Taiwan political history all the way from the prehistory, right? From the very beginning of the time. We move our way uh, to till the first turn of Chen Shui Bian, the, the first uh, elected DPP uh, president of Taiwan. And uh, we covered his uh, very dramatic re-election where he was supposedly um, had to survive an assassination attempt. And, and now, so we're, we're right around, I think like mid 2000, early 2000. Yes. And uh, I kind of want to um, backtrack a little bit and talk about, um, because after our last, our last detour, when we talked about Li Donghui, you know how like we talked a little bit more about his political legacy and what it meant for um, Taiwan's politics. And we basically came to the conclusion that rather than calling him Mr. Democracy, it's better to call, it's more accurate to call him Mr. Liberalism or Mr. Neoliberalism. And um, how, yeah. And how like his shifting like the, his um separatism towards the end of his um leadership, but especially after he stepped down, is kind of opportunism the same way his pro reunification was also a form of opportunism, and that people think oh um he was just um kind of like what what's the word like he's kind of he's been a mole the whole time and he's been sneaking around um Jiang Jingguo's back which I don't believe because Jiang Jingguo is the um intelligence guy you can't hide anything from him if you're that high profile and um yeah I think I think part of why he was like writing like all of that pro reunification stuff was partly because of the whole, um, you know, the whole Francis Fukuyama's end of history theory, and also at the same time he had the, um, what is it, Zhong Guo Bengkui Lun, and like the idea, yes. the notion that um China would disintegrate, and um, in that sort of situation, I think there was a sliver of hope that maybe hey he'll get to be the leader of a reunified China, mm. but you know, I kind of got into that. He's a, Li Denghui is a political opportunist. Opportunist. Yes. I mean, he's really good at it too. We have to give him credit. Yeah. The but what? Why? Is. What do you think his motivation is though? After he retired from presidency, right? I mean, like it, it makes sense. We can blame uh, everything on his political opportunism while he was in power. But w what is his motivation after he retired from uh, politics? Like you know, because he was still pushing for. Uh, like Taiwan independence, or a lot of people feel that he was pushing for Taiwan in independence. Okay, I think um there is sort of like um what is it like on the outside it looks like there's a discontinuity, right? But I think there actually is a continuity in that because um in the past um you know the KMT was instilling this sort of um their version of Chinese nationalism, right? But the thing is, even though it was anti-communist Chinese nationalism, that sort of nation with that sort of nationalism, you see um China's rise, you see China's um, you see China's um global position, um continue um, constantly getting better and rising up in the, you know, it's getting more respect. You know, it for the first time in maybe a century, you know, people are actually proud of being Chinese. Oh, I mean, oh I'm, I'm not saying for the first time, but um, there's more and more people are being proud of being Chinese, right? And um, I think the logical conclusion to that sort of nationalism would be, hey, you know what? Uh, maybe we were all wrong in the past and hey, let's let bygones be bygones and maybe we can work out a deal and 
because I mean, from the 70s and 80s, everyone knew the whole notion of retaking the mainland was just a political slogan, and that even like Chiang Kai-shek didn't really even believe that it was going to happen, especially after the mainland got nukes, right? So I mean, realistically, what would reunification be, right? And if that were to happen, what would Taiwan's role be in in terms of um you know the um global geopolitics? It would no longer serve as the United States um kind of it would it, it would break away from the first island chain and it would cease being like a sort of um strategic outpost of the U.S. so to speak. So I think um this sort of shift in rhetoric was intended to let Taiwan. Uh, maintain its status quo and everything but but rhetoric you know at the same time you know it, it's also a good it's also good pr because um there's no denying that chiang kai-shek and jiang jingwu were very dictatorial and they were very heavy heavy-handed and while you're doing this while you're maintaining the status quo while you're um while you're shooting the dog but at the same time um praising its master you know you, you get to um there's this sort of um I'm at a loss for words again. You can put on this sort of um progressive veneer, right? But at the, but really, why would why was um white terror being carried out in the past, right? By um you know Jiang Jiechi and stuff. I mean, you have to really the DPP it says it's against the KMT, it says it's against white terror, but you know secretly they probably think. The KMT for carrying out all that white terror because there's no more real left opposition to them. The KMT did all the dirty work for them, the blood's on their hands, and now they can revise history and say, um, oh, the um, everyone who died during white terror was a um, was a separatist hero, which is not really the case. You know, I was at work the other day, and um, you know, some my um, the Fuzhou chef. Like really likes to talk shit to um the owner of the restaurant when he's cooking and he's talking and he was bringing raising the question of um Ben Sheng and Wai Sheng Ren and um my boss was just like man that's all bullshit man he's like two doors two doors away from my house when I was little it was a Wai Sheng Ren and one day he just disappeared because um he talked too much shit about the KMT. Wow, I mean yeah that 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 kind of personal anecdote is what we don't hear. In United States, yeah. Um, but if you've heard my past episodes, you know that 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 also is a sort of um, oversimplification of the um, dynamics between the various um, groups within Taiwan. But there is also an a, element of truth. Yeah, what I was thinking is, uh, ironically, when Li Denghui was in power, Taiwan was actually in a better negotiating pos- negotiate negotiating position vis-a-vis mainland because in the early 90s there was a time when hong kong was uh the hong kong gdp was about 30 percent of the mainland gdp overall gdp and and taiwan would even be uh uh, have a even larger share would be even uh so so back then you know taiwan had a real chance to be like a very important part of the greater China region by being its uh, uh, both as financial capital, but also like a, a center of technology and research and development. But Li Denghui pursued a policy where he uh, purposely encouraged Taiwanese investment away from mainland, right? That he, he's a, one of the first to come out with a go south strategy to encourage the Taiwan business to invest in Southeast Asia rather than mainland because he he didn't want over reliance of Taiwan economy he didn't want the continual integration of Taiwan economy into the uh, into the, the mainland Chinese economy what that actually did was uh, eroding the Taiwan's position over time so now after China itself has developed in the last 30 years the the importance of Taiwan is increasingly diminished, you know, compared to to mainland China. It, whereas before you, you would have offer uh, be very, uh, I mean, yeah, you he would have a lot more negotiating chips if you were to negotiate some kind of final settlement with the mainland China. But now uh, Taiwan is more like a more like a palm between, uh, you know, the great power politics between U.S. and China now. Yeah. 
So um, I think this goes into um our topic of um Chen Suibian because he is in some ways a continuity of Li Donghui. It's very interesting is um his the, his opposition in the 2000 election was the vice um was the vice leader of Li Donghui. So it's kind of like the two sides. Like is there is there re- is it really like that different between Coca Cola and Pepsi? Is what I'm saying. You need to unmute. In that way, you know, Taiwan politics is actually very similar to the by bi- the bi party consensus in United States, right? The you know the the Republican and Democrat party. Yes, we have democracy. Yes, we have choices. But when it comes down to it. It's between Biden and Trump, right? <laughs> yes, mean, and um, for those who haven't seen the um, the special on Li Donghui, um, I want to mention that um, the democratization of Taiwan, if you look at um, history, it happened in the 80s. It also happened around the same time in South Korea. So it's not necessarily this sort of, it's not just a, fa- a matter of, um, you know, a great man, Li Donghui, deciding, oh, we want more democracy, so we're, I'm, so I'm going to, this looks like a job for me, I'm going to change everything. It was more like... Um, in the global economy, I mean, what South Korea and Taiwan were was kind of like, you know, lower, like value added sort of. Like it was the it was the um, factory of companies in like Japan and the U.S. But then as it moved up the supply chain, you know, the type of workers that were demanded from places like Taiwan and South Korea changed and it became this more sort of um, white collar, you know, middle management researcher stem like petty bourgeois intellectual so then this kind of became a hotbed for um for this sort of bourgeois democracy whereas in the past you know if you listen to our earlier episodes you find that the KMT pretty much had the um the the aristocracy and the working class covered and bought out through various means there wasn't much of a um middle class, but then with um, Jiang Jingguo's um, kind of policy of economic development, that also grew by a lot. So this, it's sort of, um, it's we need we need some class analysis when we analyze the politics of um, any society, is basically what I'm trying to say. So with that said, um, let's get to um, Chen Shui-bian. If you, um, if you notice, we talked about his, um, his um, so-called assassination attempt. We also talked about um, his policies and um, the, the, um, the troubles he went through when he first became the leader, because um, while the DBP was very good at doing elections, it didn't really have um, experience in um, actual governing beyond like you know the city level and stuff like that. But um, also, one thing that was interesting is um, in relate in regards to the um, the issue of reunification or independence in 2000, um, Chen Shui-bian had a policy of the four no's and one without. I, I guess this works better in Chinese. Uh, I have my notes over here. Uh, yeah, basically he was no um declaration of independence no changing of the um of the um what is guohao the name of the the name of the country so in this case the so called republic of china because a part of taiwan independence is the abolition of the um the government on taiwan and establishing a so called um, republic of taiwan or something along those lines um we're not going to pursue um adding the whole um, two state theory two state meaning of like mainland China and Taiwan are now two countries into the constitution. And we're not going to um, change the status quo by doing a referendum on reunification or independence. And the one without means um, is that we don't have the intention of um, abolishing the National Unification Council or the National Unification Guidelines. And he did keep that promise. He didn't abolish it. What he did in, uh, I think, 2006 was he just cut cut off all the funding so they didn't function anymore. Some lawyers, you know. So um, 
but by 2007, he went to a um a FAPA event, the Formosan American. What is what does it stand for? It's it's a it's it's a U.S. based um Taiwan independence organization. Let me see what it stands for. I want to say FAPA means um FAP to America, but that's not what it means. Oh, Formosa Association for Public Affairs. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, he, at that speech, he came up with a new um formula, which was um four wants and one without. 四要一没有，台湾要独立，台湾要证明，台湾要新鲜，台湾要发展，台湾没有左右路线，只有统独问题。so um, Taiwan wants independence. Taiwan wants um, the rectification of its name. Taiwan wants a new constitution. Taiwan wants development. And there's no um, question of left and right in Taiwan, only a question of reunification and independence. So I think the last bit kind of gives away um, what – I mean, yeah, you see a shift in his attitude, but his last – his last thing kind of gives it away. I mean – as long as classes exist, there will always be questions of left and right, right? So, um, Carl, what, what, what do you think, um, all of this means? Now think about what happened between, um, the years 2000 and 2007. You mean, uh, in terms of like global politics or economy or Oh, just just um, limit the scope to Taiwan and Chen Shui-bian. No, I'm not sure what you're trying to get at. So 2007 was pretty much when he kind of just reneged on his um four no's and one without, which, you know how when he first became leader, he was like, okay, yeah, our status quo, we're not going to declare independence, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do that. But in 2007, all of a sudden, he's like, yeah, man, Taiwan wants independence, Taiwan wants to... um. Rectify its name. Taiwan wants this and that. I mean, if you th- if you think about it, I, and then he also says there's no question of left and right, just um, just reunification and um, independence. So I mean, isn't that and the place where he gave the speech was at FAPA, which is a separatist, also pro U.S. organization. He's appealing to us to the hardliners for Taiwan independence because he. By then, he had already pissed off all of, like pissed off everyone else. Because what happened in 2006, um, there was some intel that um he was wiring um funds to offshore banks in Switzerland. Ah. Or he was and his wife was. Right, right. Yes. And then um, yeah, it was it was a lot of money, but um, so at at that point in 2006, the former. The former chairman of the DPP, um, Chen Shui-bian's party, Shi Mingde, who was also a um, um, a political prisoner in the past, started this whole um, what's it called, um, 百万人民反贪反贪腐反贪腐倒扁运动, million, and it's translated to million voices against corruption. President Chen must go. So yeah, I mean even even like an OG DDP um DPP um guy is out doing these sorts of movements and um it was um like the, it was like a pretty big event like everyone was dressed in red and like they were occupying all the major streets of Taipei the um and they were all calling for um uh, Chen Shui-bian to step down I remember that in fact uh, Siminde was uh, invited over by um, the so-called Rupert Murdoch of Asia, Jimmy Lai, uh, the, the billionaire tycoon, uh, owner of Apple Daily in Hong Kong during the Hong Kong, just before the Hong Kong protest. So there, there was a leak taping of Jimmy Lai inviting uh, Si Minde over to learn from him the tactics uh, organizing <laughs> the protests in Taiwan. Uh, this 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 was leaked in, into the press. I think this, this was... Um, this was either before the, the latest round of Hong Kong protests or the last, uh, the, the umbrella, um, the, the, the umbrella movement few years back. But, but this, this was a big thing back then in the Hong Kong press when it was leaked. So, so that, that's what reminded me of um, 
when uh, Si Min, so Si Min, Jimmy Lai actually pays Si Min a huge sum of money, like supposedly for a, a book deal, but everybody knows it's because <laughs> it's because of this. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of these mass movements in Taiwan do have um, characteristics of color revolutions. I mean, look at who um, who joins them, whether it be the anti Chen Shui Bian movement or the um, like the sunflower movement, which we'll probably get to later today. It's a lot of um, like middle class people and not like working class. I'm not saying that like a movement is only legitimate if it's like mostly working class, but it says a lot about the class characteristics of these sorts of things. That's a good point. That's that is a very common shared feature of many color revolutions around yes. the world. I mean, um, so at that point, Chen Shui-bian was pretty much the the remaining support he had was like the hardline, um, like pretty much fascist, um, separatists in Taiwan. Whereas like the more lukewarm pro-independence people and like the lukewarm like the, reunification and status quo people were already like well you know you made all these sorts of promises we were um you know we thought that at the turn of the century and with the first um peaceful transfer of power between two parties you know taiwan was looking towards a brighter future but instead like the economy is not as good as before and um, because i remember like the 90s were a period of optimism and the so-called free world so like yeah. I remember in the 90s, in the 90s when I went to Taiwan, there was, I mean I, I was a little kid, but I could sense this sort of um, air of optimism and like consumerism was like on the rise. Because I mean like just a few decades before this sort of like Western style consumerism, where like you know you buy buy buy, like that wasn't much of a thing in Taiwan. It's, it seemed uh, like in the 80s and I, 90s it was like pretty new. Also in the 90s, that that's also when uh you know the the Soviet Union had collapsed. Uh, China is opening up, so all the capitals, uh, all the Western capitals, capitals were rushing in to to capitalize on the um, to 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 try to grab market and trying to exploit resources and labor in these former communist countries. But also also China because China opened its own market. Um, and and I remember in the early 90s, like there was a lot of that's when Taiwan just started to offsource offshore a lot of the factories to China, a lot of manufacturing jobs to China um, because to take advantage of the cheaper land and labors on the mainland. Um, and I, I mentioned this before, but there was a Taiwan uh, movie from early 90s called uh, Shaolin Shaozi. Uh, but it's uh, it's very popular apparently in Indonesia. My fiance Ani <laughs> watched it, and he, she she knows she's like, oh, Boboho. That's that's how how they know. And I I watched the movie with her. Like the the movie itself is kind of really it's a product of its time. It, it's it, one of the background story of the movie was that the father of the protagonist he is moving the factory to mainland. Right, and the mom, the mom is worried that the dad is hooking up with some mainland mistress, <laughs> and then I think eventually. So was the he? Family, um, I didn't Probably. finish watching the movie. Oh. <laughs> I didn't finish watching the movie. <laughs> but but the, the the family, I think eventually they went over to mainland. Uh, but 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 a couple of things I got taken away from the movie is early in the early nineties, majority of the Taiwan people still uh, identify as Chinese. Yes. <laughs> And 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 two, this kind of uh, uh, like the the neoliberalism, uh, it's it's like the golden age of neoliberalism, right? That this when uh, when when uh, it looks like the markets, new markets are opening up, and and the the, the, the capitals are, are rushing in to, to take advantage, and then everything looks like everything is going up. There's like you said, there's a bright optimism about the future, but but then that's gonna change as the globalism globalization take its course because the you know all the all the job then all the manufacturing job then is also getting off sourced to yes. mainland and 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 taiwan it's increasingly looking like a developed economy in the west where the economy getting increasingly financialized right like the it's changing into a service economy but the service economy is in a way it's not providing people with the same kind of the 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 the, secu the 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 job security or the 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 good just good living standard as before like like before like be 
in the early 90s, I remember late 80s, 90s, a lot of the Taiwanese have, like you said, very optimistic about the future. I don't think that's the same today. It's definitely not. Um, in fact, um, like in the United States or in Taiwan, you like talk to the youth, they're pretty like, I don't know, they're pretty nihilistic. It's kind of depressing. But then like you go to like a place like Shanghai, you know, the um, the younger people, you know, they they seem to have a sort of direction. I mean, yeah, they'll they'll have their problems. They'll like have concerns. They're not going to be happy with everything. No, nobody's ever happy with everything. But overall, they're, you know, there's some sort of um, they're, they're happy with the overall trajectory. And I like to um, mention another thing. I probably mentioned this before, but um, the whole optimism in the 90s was also the Soviet Union collapsed. And, um, you know, in Taiwan, Taiwanese education, it would have been like, oh, yeah, Soviet Union was um, was a dictatorship and it was a tyranny and it was, you know, whatever. And so was Chiang Kai-shek. So it's like a horseshoe theory. And then they're like, well, Taiwan is now a democracy and the Soviet Union has gone. So now we're entering an age of democracy so they never really asked the, they're never taught to ask the question of democracy for whom like there's bourgeois democracy there's proletarian democracy there's you know there's no there's no such thing as absolute democracy because freedom for one necessarily involves um the curtailment of freedom for somebody else for example if, if you see um living state like um free housing as a as a right for example that's a freedom you know you're free from becoming homeless then you're curtailing the freedoms of you know some um some like landlord like Carl over here according to his detractors <laughs> from, um, you know okay disclaimer i'm not a landlord right i my my fiance originally rented a villa uh, with intention to turn into a bnb but because um uh, you know we, we the only reason we did that was to supplement my income from this podcast but because of the covid situation there's no flights coming to bali so we are just living here right now we're we're, we're renting <laughs> we're, we're still pro <laughs> yeah yeah but um so i mean um there, there's always a class characteristic of all of these things. And um, I guess with liberalism, you're taught to um, look at everything but this. So it, it's like the um, it's like the glue that connects everything together. But if you don't have this sort of class consciousness, then, yeah, you can you can be unhappy as you want. You can protest. You can do this and that. But you're not going to fundamentally change anything. And that's the state of um, Taiwanese democracy as well as, you know, U.S. democracy. You know, you, ha you have two parties. You. Like you have the Republican Party, you got the Democratic Party, like one of them weighs you down too much, you get tired, you just switch switch shoulders until you feel the same and then you switch back. It's the um art of looking like there's progress while not doing anything. And um Let me stop the recording for a second because there, there there's a lag. Yeah. Are talking about um, basically, in the 90s, uh, optimism in Taiwan shifted because of the globalization, uh, the impact of global globalization, right? Yeah. Because um, we, I think I'm not going to repeat too much of myself um, from the last time we spoke, but um, there was the the total pretty much neoliberalization of Taiwan pretty much happened throughout the 90s and the early 2000s because um, when in the, up until the 80s, I mean, it was still pretty much um. It was it was very capitalistic, but it was a sort of um, there was more sort of economic um, control by the government. It wasn't totally it wasn't totally, you know, neoliberalized yet. Yeah, because Taiwan uh, was following like the Asian development model, right? I mean, yeah, Taiwan, yeah. Korea, South Korea, they all kind of adopted the state intervention uh, in economy, the, the same model that the Japan pioneered. Right. And then that was ad adopted by the so-called tiger economies like uh, Taiwan and Korea. And, and China, I think, co-opted to a certain extent as well. Uh, you know, the idea is that, you know, rather than the so-called invisible hand of the market to dictate everything, uh, the state actually play an active role in setting out like industrial policy, you know, with, outlining what what is important sector to develop and so on and so forth uh, but but that that have changed that changed in Taiwan after uh, 1990s because you know it's a 
it's a decade of uh, end of history, right? And the triumph of neoliberalism worldwide. Yep. So basically, towards the end of um, Chen Shui-bian's leadership, I mean, yeah, it, it was kind of this whole the whole optimism of the '90s had pretty much been shattered. But um, but then like people were just starting to kind of blame, oh, it's just his um corruption, and it's um, you know, if we find a, we just need somebody to bring us back on track. So there was this sort of hope again, and I guess the hope came in the form of Ma Ying-jeou, who was elected in 2008. So this marked the second, um, this marked the second um, transfer of power between the two major parties in Taiwan. This time back to the KMT. As you'll find out, um, Ma Ying-jeou didn't really undo much of um, Li Donghui and Chen Shui-bian's policies. I mean, the the um, the separatists will disagree. But in I the end, it's question. basically, yeah. Uh, so, you know, Chen Shui-bian served out two terms, right? But yes. at the end of which he was, DPP became deeply unpopular. Now, is that just because of the corruption scandal of Chen Shui-bian's personal corruption problem? Or, mostly. Or that, it's, it's mostly that. Okay. okay. Yes. So, I mean, with Ma Zhou, it was basically, okay, well, we need to uh, kind of revitalize the economy. So how are we going to do it? Well, even though um, travel between um, Taiwan and the mainland had been um, opened up for for a long time, by two thousand eight, there was still um, it was still done very indirectly. Like mail, like um, mail wasn't shipped directly to the mainland or from the mainland directly to Taiwan. They had to pass through a third um, they had a third um, neutral zone like Hong Kong or South Korea, et cetera. Um, trans- transport was also not direct. So if um, I remember the first time I went to mainland China in 2005, I had to, we had to fly to Hong Kong first before we could fly to Beijing. And that whole ordeal took a whole day. Whereas if you fly from Taipei to Beijing, it's just like, what is it, like three hours? And also direct trade, for example, like um, shipping. Sh- shipping containers didn't go travel freely from Taiwan to mainland China or vice versa until 2008. So um, um, this was um, the direct links. These are called the three links or San Tong were proposed by Deng Xiaoping in 1979. So the three links are, um, you know, Tong Yo, Tong Hang, Tong Shang. At the time, Jiang Jingguo responded with the three no's. You'll see that in, Ch- in, in, in Chinese politics, people like to have these sort of numbered policies. Um, so um, no contact, no negotiation, and no compromise, or 不接触, 不谈判, 不妥协. Zhang Jingguo at that time said, um, 与中国共产党接触就是自杀行为, 我们没那么愚蠢. So he, he said at the time, um, um, contacting um, the Chinese Communist Party is suicidal, and we are not that stupid. But as you can see in the previous episodes, that changed. Um, especially towards the end of Jiang Jingguo's leadership, when he was kind of forced to let, kind of pressured by various forces into letting um, civil war veterans return to the mainland to see their families and stuff. Anyways, Ma Ying-jeou, um, when he became leader, he finally, after, you know, what, from like 79 to 2008, so like after 40 years, nearly, like 30 years, 31 years. You still there? 29 years? I'm here. <laughs> you yeah. want me to it's help just awkwardly me it's just awkwardly silent because you're um because you're um on mute. Yeah, yeah. I'm so, I'm, yeah. I'm mute because I want, don't want to introduce the background noise of chicken clucking and my dog's barking. The um noise cancellation is actually pretty good, so I can't hear anything. Okay. Uh, um yeah, the um, so it was like after twenty nine years, this finally happened. So the intention was, you know, with uh, more contact and more, um, like int- the introduction of mainland tourism into Taiwan and all that stuff, it would help revitalize the economy. And um, you know, that was kind of so. There was this whole new era of optimism. But as you can imagine, um, the more hardline separatists were very unhappy with this. Carl, do you remember any of this sort of stuff happening? 
I mean, I I remember uh, even before the three direct links were lifted. I, I mean, like I, I remember during um, Li Denghui era, he was very resistant. I mean, in fact, he was a big uh, uh, like because because the mainland was also hoping hoping to uh, it was kind of pushing for it, right? I mean, because uh, mainland China was welcoming Taiwanese. Uh, investment and they were also wishing for deeper integration between the mainland and Taiwan economy and and, and what one a big um, you know policy direct directive of Li Denghui and also Chen Shui Bian era kind of trying to cool down the level of Taiwanese investment in mainland and trying to uh, steer away kind of the econ- economic the natural economic link that was that was forming between mainland and Taiwan and they're trying to redirect it. Uh, you know, if we're going to offshore jobs anyway, let's let's offshore uh, our factories to like Vietnam or or Southeast Asia, where we're not somehow beholden to the Chinese communists, right? So I, I remember that. Yeah. So basically, when Ma Yingzhou did this, he had to update Jiang Jingguo's three no's. So the new three no's are, 不同, 不读, 不武, or no reunification, no independence, and no use of force. So it's just, you know what, let's just um, maintain the status quo so, indefinitely and not talk about it. Yeah, I mean, basically, I think we talked about this before. Um, at mm-hmm. this point, in, in terms of um, policy tour mainland, KNT and, and DPP both are essentially status quo parties. E- even though DPP espoused you know, rhetorics of independence, but they actually haven't done anything when, when they are in power. I mean, both, but, but look at Chen Sui Bian's leadership. I mean, what he he didn't really do much except for like they'll they'll do provocations and stuff because like if you provoke the mainland short of like causing any sort of um direct confrontation, then like the hardliners will will, will like applaud you for it, saying like, oh, like this is like. You got a lot of guts for doing that. You're, you know, you're standing up for Taiwan, Taiwanese sovereignty, and whatnot. And uh, yeah, and also if they provoke uh, mainland enough to, you know, if mainland conducts some kind of military exercise or or missile test, that actually helps them in polls, right? In, in the yeah. election. So so it becomes more of elect. The whole uh, independence versus pro, uh, pro, uh, unification became uh, more of an election gimmick. Like that doesn't really necessarily translate into policy, even though Chen Shui Bian has uh, threatened a couple of times to hold a referendum, right? But that, that never came to pass. This is why I really wanted to highlight his whole on there's no issue when he said there's no issue of left and right in Taiwan, there's only an issue of independence and um, reunification. Because this is the perfect, this is the perfect um, release valve for, you know, all sorts of popular discontent for um, whatever things. And um, I guess Ma Angel's leadership was basically um, a return to the so-called 1992 consensus, which is, you know, hey, um, the issue between the two governments are going to take a while to resolve. So for now, let's just agree that there is only one China, but there's two interpretations of what that China is. And we're, we're free to interpret it however we want on each side. So it was kind of a return to that. And that also... Um, that also pissed off the DPP. So you're going to notice, like, no matter what Ma Yingzhou does during this time period, one, there's not much fundamental change in Taiwan other than, you know, um, yeah, we n- now we get more contact with mainlanders. Now mainland tourists are finally allowed to come to Taiwan and this sort of stuff. But other than that, you know. I remember, um, you know, reading the blogs of uh, one Michael Turton, who is American expat living in Taiwan, and he's a big supporter of DPP. He was, um, you know, he he was criticizing the Ma Angel's policy a lot because he feels like that's a that's a just a Trojan horse for mainland influence to come to Taiwan, kind of like a lot of the rhetorics we're seeing right now in U.S. You know, like talking about. Oh my God! Banning Ma Angel's government bought more weapons from the U.S. than Chen Shui Bian's government. Uh, I doubt he ever mentions that. Ah, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I mean, it's he's he's a very uh, partisan guy. This uh, Michael Turton. I mean, he's, he's all a very liberal. Yeah, yeah. 
and, and we we talk about the the DPP and the um, and the KMT. They do just do a lot of posturing on this issue of independence, and it's really used as a you know part like uh, like a kind of I, I don't want to say dog whistle uh, to the uh, identity politics, but it's what distract from the real issues of like structural problem in Taiwan, right? This puts the DPP at an advantage because the KMT is in such an awkward position. It can't go back to the whole, oh, we're the, it can't go back to actively, actively pursuing the whole, um, you know, oh, we're the legitimate China stance. It can't really call for a reunification without pissing a lot of the people off just because of, you know, the years of um, independence education. But it, it's basically it, yeah, it's just status quo. But then it doesn't have the it doesn't have the slogans that get people fired up like the DPP does. Like the DPP is also a status quo party, but then they they have all of these um you know, we're gonna stand up against China, we're gonna do this and that. The KMT's stuff now is they pretty much don't they try to avoid social issues. For example, like um issues like gay marriage, they just won't touch that because a lot of their supporters now are just the older generations, you know. And I guess they're a little bit more socially conservative, whereas the DPP, they're in a position where they can just um, co-opt anything like, you know, for example, the um, the anti-nuclear power stuff, the um, the gay rights. And this is not saying that, like, you know, gay rights are bad. It's just saying they're easily it's an issue that's that can easily be co-opted for political purposes as, you know. So DPP just yeah, he, kind of has mastered this sort of these sorts of politics. So I mean, mind yeah, you, I mean, DPP, when the the, K, the KMT at this point, what they the, the only promise they ever deliver is oh the see look the DPP is always like it, it's being very divisive and it's fucking up the economy. So we're just gonna fix the economy, but then they can never really fundamentally fix the economy because the 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 um the institutions are still fundamentally the same, right? Sorry, my dog is barking, so I had to discipline my, my dog. Go ahead. Oh. No, I, I'm, I'm pretty much done talking. Oh, okay, so can we just move on to the, you know, the Ma ying presidency and... That's what we're doing right now. So, I mean, you're just seeing, like, um, promises of the economy. You know, he's signing all these trade agreements, like um, the FAPA. No, no, not FAPA, ECFA. Or the economic... What does it stand for? Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement. And, um, you know, boost to um, boost bilateral trade. So basically, the main thing about Ma Angel's um, leadership is common theme, bilateral trade has increased between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. And, um, what the D and then um, supporters of the DPP and separatists are now very concerned because there were all of a sudden now they're anti capitalist in some ways. They they're like, oh, um, free trade is bad. See, um, actually, no, free trade is good, but not with mainland China. So now there's this sort of paranoia about oh, how, um, okay, the um, the the mainland's not going to reunify with force, but through economics. So there is this sort of paranoia i mean like the taiwan i see a lot of echoes uh in like taiwan politics in in united states i mean like because uh, like what what taiwan has uh, experienced before is what we're experiencing in united states right now you know vis-a-vis -vis china like 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 the, the donald trump's uh decoupling policy from from china is not uh, you know, it's not that U.S. is against globalization per se. It's just they are just against uh, U.S. having, you know, like, like the deep economic integration with China. They, they, they just want the multinationals go elsewhere. Right. So like all that had happened on a, a smaller scale on Taiwan before. But now now it's playing playing out in U.S. because as, as China becoming more important in the world economy. This is um very interesting in Taiwan because um neo the the whole um institution of neoliberalism in today's world is effectively headed by the United States. So then um and people in Taiwan are feeling the effects of neoliberalism and they're unhappy because you know yeah there's a lot of bilateral trade but is the quality of life for many Taiwanese people improving? It's difficult to say because you know with 
with with capitalism, it's like, yeah, there's increased trade, but who's profiting? That's also a very important question. So um, this there's a sort of yeah. It seems to them that Mindjo was selling out Taiwan, and um, because he's also from the KMT, which, like you know, traditionally espoused this sort of Chinese nationalism. So all these, and then in 2013, 2014, um, there was something called the Cross Strait Service Trade Agreement, which is another one of these, um, you know, free trade agreements that um would, um. Liberalized economic activities between um, Taiwan and mainland China, but it was passed. It, it was kind of um, people felt that it was done undemocratically, so that led that led up to the um, the sunflower student movement. Now, can you? The, yeah, can we talk about that? Because the some is it? I mean, what what do you think is behind uh, the the sunflower movement? Is it people's uh, like, is it people's dissatisfaction with globalization, or is is it um, you know, kind of xenophobia, like kind of xenophobic fear of mainland? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, you look at all color revolutions; there there are legitimate sparks of dissatisfaction. The question, the the um, what the the um, the the thing is, what do you do with that spark, and how do you channel the energy to make it um accomplish um your political ends, you know? I mean, what, what, what do you think of the Sunflower Movement? Um, I mean, from afar, to me, it just seems like um, irrational fear uh, of mainland that, that kind of um, captivated a lot of the, the Taiwan's youth. And on top of that, also there's maybe a certain level of dissatisfaction with uh, effects of global capitalism, right? Because as we mentioned before, um, you know, Taiwan was experiencing a lot of the problems that developed uh, Western economy were experiencing, right? The jobs were being offshored. And, and also in this case, to, to mainland China, uh, the economy was being increasingly financialized. Uh, you know, like the, there was the asset inflation or the, you know, the, the, the real estate price when sky high, a lot of young people can't afford their their own uh, own houses unless you know their parents already own, and and there's just not a lot of economic prospect for the people young people entering into the workforce. Uh, that that I think I th- that I think is is what's driving it. This is my take, and that's for the most part true. Okay, I, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for your for your take, sir. Oh, I'm I'm just like it's just so awkward with the whole like mute thing. It's easier when it's back and forth. So I mean, there was a level of um of political opportunism in there, and uh, like I said before, you know, people in Taiwan they they um oftentimes feel the effects of neoliberalism and capitalism, but with decades of um decades of anti-communist um propaganda, and also the fact that you know the left what what existed of the left was violently crushed by Jiang Jieshi. it's kind of um it's become this sort of like baizuo left you look at and and i think um the sunflower movement is a perfect example because i mean yes aside from the um anti mainland um sentiments that a lot of the people undoubtedly had um it was a protest against neoliberalism and thus capitalism and who is the head of neoliberalism it is the u.s but it would seem that um you know if you carry this to its logical conclusion you would have to be against the u.s correct yeah but what do these protesters do they go on change.org no not change.org whitehouse.gov and write a bunch of um, petitions asking the u.s to intervene and help no way yeah, there's quite a few of them. When one of them was to like investigate Mind Joel to see if his green card is still, um, is it, it, still in effect or whatever, because they just think that th- there's this whole idea that okay, after Mind Joel sells out Taiwan, he's going to escape to America. Wow. There's a lot of this, um, a lot of these conspiracy theories, and um, there's no um, I mean, you look at the leadership 
the the lead figures of the sunflower movement, Lin Feifan. He was a student, but now he's um uh now he's a pretty um uh what is it pretty pretty public figure of the DPP. He joined the DPP, and now he's like one of the it's one of like the new generation DPP. The other one of the other people, um Huang Guochang, Huang Guochang went on to um join the newly formed um. People's Power Party. Wait, what is it? The New Power Party. Now the the New Power Party. That's a pro independence party, right? Yes, it's um actually very Maidan esque. So it's like um, it kind of poses itself as um as leftist. You know, oh yeah, we want workers' rights and we want more um human rights and um you know civil rights and all that stuff. And and but and then they're also um you know pro independence, and then they became a became um part of what was known as Disanshili or the um third force, you know the with with the main two forces being the blue camp and the green camp. But realistically, I mean, is the new power party really that like different from the deep? It's just a more hip version of the DPP in many ways, but it has this sort of um. Because you know how um, the DPP started off as an opposition as opposition against the KMT, right? And it had that sort of um, revolutionary aesthetic to a certain extent. Yep. But then after after being in power for so long, the DPP's kind of lost that, and I think the new power party is just kind of there to um, revitalize that sort of that sort of um, revolutionary um, aesthetic that's been missing from Taiwanese politics for so long, especially from the um, from the the more um, independence leaning side of things, but then you look at like Huang Guochang and the way that um in the New Power Party and the way they relate they relate to the United States. It's like how are they any different from the status quo? Yeah, their um their their platform is you know we're going to rewrite the constitution and um change it so that it's no longer a um one China constitution but strictly a one Taiwan. Constitution, you know. I mean, the p- appeal to U.S. It's uh, this is actually fairly common in many parts of East Asia, not just Taiwan. I mean, uh, Hong Kong as well, right? People look up yeah, yeah. U.S. as like the the um, the world policeman, but unironically, right? They they look to U.S. as kind of the ultimate. Uh, Arbiter and and uh, of the of the world of the world affair. I think it, 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 I think there's a couple of layers to that. There's you know one layer is the effect after effect of colonialism, um, and then mm-hmm. the other part is because U.S. military was uh, you know after the 1972 um, agreement with uh, Nixon after Nixon visit. China, U.S. military was removed from Taiwan. So, so people in Taiwan they don't necessarily feel the direct, uh, the direct effect of occupation. Say like, uh, people of Okinawa feel on daily basis. Uh, you know, then and and also to a to a different extent, Hong Kong as well after 1997 handover to China. So, but but they still they to them the U.S. is um, this over uh are many present yet it's like they they the the all powerful and and you know of course the leader of the free world uh and at the same time they themselves are kind of shielded from like the 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 worst um, of everything yes yes exactly exactly that's what i want because it's kind of like um it's kind of like um what malcolm x said about you know the field slaves and the house slaves Taiwan is more of like a house slave society, meaning it's still a victim of imperialism, but it's um because of um certain historical factors and geopolitical factors, it kind of joined the ranks of it kind of um it ascended to sort of this status as like a more as a higher level junior partner of imperialism rather than just like a directly exploited society like i i oftentimes tell people in taiwan if the island of taiwan were just moved to the middle of the caribbean yeah you're, you're gonna see like coca-cola um hiring death squads to kill um 
to, to kill um, striking workers. And then um, if you try to um, fight for too much rights, the U.S. is just going to come in and overthrow the government and, and um, install a new one that it's more happy with. I mean, it's um, I, I think um, the new the stuff like the New Power Party and the Sunflower Movement, I mean, the New Power Party grew from the Sunflower Movement. And then you had people like um, Freddie Lim, Lin, Chang, Lin Changzuo, who um, was also a pretty big figure in the whole um, New Power Party before he left. I mean, what 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 was his job before he, other than being the lead singer of a, a death metal band, he was also he also worked at Amnesty International. And then when he got elected as a legislator, he his office had this huge portrait of the Dalai Lama behind his um office desk. So you can kind of tell the um the um the the politics of these people. They're just kind of they're cruise missile and socialists in quotes. They're um. Uh- they might speak against imperialism, but they're effectively – they stand on the side of imperialism. Every revolution they support is only a color revolution. So I like to call these people silmang or colorblind because they only see the revolution part of color revolution. So they don't see the fact that it's not really a revolution or they do, but they're opportunists. But I, I think in, – in the case of Freddie Lim, I'm not even sure. I think he's just stupid. Like <laughs> what, if we're talking about if we're talking about politicians like my angel or tying one, I wouldn't say that they're stupid. I think they're um, career politicians. And they really know what they're doing, you know. But I think these kids, I, they're just. What What do you think of Freddie Lim's music, though? I mean, I, I came to know Freddie Lim because um, I watch Eddie Huang's uh, Eddie Huang's uh, Fresh Off the Boat food documentary where he traveled around the world. And sampling food, and because Eddie Huang is, uh, I think he's his family originally from Taiwan, so he yeah. he took uh, uh, he he did a couple of trips to Taiwan where he actually met, I, I believe he met Freddie Lim. And, yeah, and yeah. They, they had a disagreement had a, on their um self identity. Yes, they actually had a big argument ver- on like the re- reunification issue because you know Freddie Lim obviously is is pro independence, and they they feature like kind of a few clips of the. Freddie Lim's band, and uh, yeah, I, I want I want your take on his music first. Yeah. Uh, too old. Sound like it, <laughs> well, it, it's it's basically what like my parents said about rap, like oh it's too noisy. But then I think with death metal, I don't know. I, death metal was never really my thing. But I think um if if I were to be um perfectly honest, just just like despite my political disagreements with him, I think it's um. I think his um, Minanghua is pretty good. The way he writes and um, you know, but uh, I'm just, I don't know. Like, well, there's that one video I, of that song where like they have because um, you know, like for a while the KMT back um during the earlier part of like in in the 30s or the 20s, you know, in the 30s they were like kind of kind of like friends with the Nazis. So then they had this um music video of like this air- aristocratic dinner party between like Nazis and KMT members and how they go in and they like kill them all. But then it's just like okay, but I mean, do you guys realize that right now you're siding with America and America is one of the biggest Nazi enablers in today's age? I think there's just uh, there's just huge levels of cognitive dissonance in his politics, and then um, and that's reflected in his music. So from like um, from a sta- the standpoint of criticizing the um, the content of his music, that's how I feel. It's pretty much the same as my criticism against his politics. And uh, uh, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, and this reminds me um. The um, the, I I read an article by this Taiwanese trot who is in um this New York Trotsky Trotskyite cult, the International Marxist Ten, uh, Marxist Tendency, the IMT. He actually inter he actually interviews Freddie, and Freddie's just like, well, you know, there's no point in calling ourselves left or right because you know if you just ask the questions like, are we for workers' rights? Yes. Are we for this and that? Then you know the question of left and right is just extra. But then it's like. Then why are you like dodging the question? You know. So this is pretty much like this kind of reflects the whole attitude of the youth in Taiwan of today. Which is why I'm kind of mentioning this. It's this sort of um you you have like just very. It's it's just 
like center left populism and right wing populism. Yeah, that's that's my feeling too. I mean, the, well, I I just my I just got that from that uh, Eddie Huang um, Huang uh, 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 video vlog. But I mean, I I wanted to your your opinion. Obviously, yeah. you know more about this. So I mean, after the whole um, sunflower incident and just this feeling of helplessness, you know, you're feeling the effects of neoliberalism. But if you don't really see it as neoliberalism, you'll see it as capitalism. You have to find you have to find a scapegoat. So I think um, what really happened during Ma Angel's leadership was the scapegoat because there were you know in, there were more and more um, trade agreements with the mainland, and Ma Angel appeared to be be like um, less. He was less antagonistic towards the mainland than like Li Donghui or Chen Shui-bian. So then it, it eventually became that the scapegoat just became China in the abstract. It became so bad that um I think early in the Tsai Ing-wen leadership when there were um when there were um labor movements they were they were against the slashing of of paid vacations right what happened was they ended up getting red baited and red like um they were um these workers were just being accused by like the fascists of being um pro China you want to know why why because it so happens that, like you know, most of the paid vacations happen to be Chinese holidays. So then, basically, the fascists are just like, "Oh, you guys are just um, being pro-China, and you you guys want your want to celebrate your Chinese holidays." And it's like, no, these workers want paid vacations. They're overworked and underpaid. Like, come on. Wait, I mean, this these are like we're are we talking about traditional Chinese Chinese holidays? Like, you know, yeah. Some of them, yeah. Other ones might be might be um days might be holidays that had to do with like um the with the, with the so called ROC administration, like um like that like the so called National Day on um on uh, October tenth commemorating the um the Xinhai Revolution when the Qing Dynasty was overthrown, things like that. I think oh, it's mostly okay. stuff like that. Okay, that makes sense because I I'm like wait you know. The, Chinese traditional holidays, I, I sound like shouldn't be compared. aren't 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 too controversial. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so it, um, the Mindjo leadership kind of just ended with the um, sunflower movement. Basically, the sunflower movement happened in 2014. Mindjo's leadership ended in 2016, and um, Tsai Ing-wen won after losing to him in 2012. I think um another thing that led to um people being paranoid against um this you know this China the big bad China in the abstract was also um I think was it 2014 that the umbrella um movement happened in Hong Kong? Yeah. It was either 14 or 15. 14. 14. Uh so it's the same same year as the sunflower movement. And um I think um especially I noticed with a lot of my friends during that time like they were really a lot of them were just kind of just started to really get into politics. People, I don't know, their world their worldviews just kind of shifted. I mean, I remember having one friend who was who used to be like kind of like semi pro China, all of a sudden just becoming like pretty like pro independence. Like it was like a it was a period of um just kind of questioning him like who am I? Am I actually Chinese or am I am I Taiwanese? Am I this? Am I that? You know. But what 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 drove this kind of ident- identity crisis? So I mean, like this. I think um for the longest time, even when Chen Shui-bian was leader and under Li Donghui, there, it was kind of people just thought, oh, reunification is never going to happen. But then with Ma Ying-jeou, like Ma Ying-jeou and his um kind of economic liberalization with the mainland, people just got paranoid that oh, reunification is going to be like imminent or it might actually happen or there's a chance that the uh, um the Ch- Chinese Communist Party might do something and we're gonna we're gonna in Taiwan as we know it's gonna end. It's that sort of existential um worry and then coupled with you know the feeling the effects of neoliberalism and needing a needing a scapegoat, I, I feel like mainland China 
in the abs- it's just like it's kind of like you know to it's kind of like the Jew of Germany you know how like the Jew was just like the scapegoat and then uh, there were for a variety of reasons there were anti-semitic sentiments and then people in power knew how to um Manip- manipulate those existing feelings and kind of just avoid really dealing with the roots of the main questions and that's just kind of what's happening in Taiwan today especially I think I think this process kind of began under during the time of my angel's leadership and it's going on still to this day what do you think so from my perspective you know like a lot of the um I, I think a lot of people on the mainland feels the same way too, is that they feel the kind of the Taiwan independence movement started under Li Denghui. And then Li Denghui is really the person that pioneered the kind of the, the Taiwan identity and decinification. And then Chen Sui Bian is just more extreme version of that. And, and Ma ying is, uh, is a person, like you say, like a status quo person. <laughs> and then didn't really undo didn't really undo on what Chen Sui Bian did because I mean it was it, it, it would have been a pretty risky move. My angel did undo some things like um for example um Zhonghua Post or or Chinese Post translated into English the um the it's kind of like the USPS of Taiwan got changed to Taiwan Post and then my angel changed it back to um Zhonghua Youzheng or Zhonghua Post. Uh, Chiang Kai Shek Memorial Hall got renamed the um Democracy Hall and then that got change back to Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall. Things like, little, little things like that. The changes in... other and... words, a lot of the cosmetic, symbolic changes, right? Not, but yes. Not, not... But the education stuff, like, from the, the, um, the change, the curriculum that was changed by Chen Shui-bian, that more or less remained. Yeah, per- so... Yeah, it just remained. Yeah, so that's why, from, like, kind of the mainland point of view, it feels like there's a drift, uh, you know, like, a further and further away from, like, the the Chinese identity, you know, especially among the Taiwan youth. But a lot of the, you know, mainly they, they also don't understand the, the socioeconomic conditions in Taiwan that kind of facilitated that. Yeah. You have, to rem- you have to remember, like, this stuff, you can't, it's not that, you can't overestimate the power of these sorts of cosmetic things. Because, I mean, look, Japan tried, tried this sort of assimilation program and tried to erase Chinese history from Taiwan. Japan ruled... Taiwan for 50 years. Chinese culture still existed when they left. Yeah, you have to remember um if you it, it, like maybe in the cities in Taipei the um the middle the people from the middle classes and the richer people they're like kind of their world outlook is more pro US. They're a little bit more like wanna be American. They they see themselves as like a metropolitan global metropolitan citizens and stuff like that. But then if you go to the countryside in Taiwan, what are I mean in the cities people are watching Netflix shows, they're watching a bunch of um American American stuff, but if you go to like more rural areas, I mean, this stuff is still pretty foreign to them, and they're actually more comfortable watching stuff from the mainland because it's stuff that they understand better and maybe connect with more. But they're also the people in Taiwan who have less of a voice. Um, that's that's something I actually didn't think about before. That's a good, very good point. Yeah. So, I mean, what what else is um what what other developments do you think um we should touch up on? I I think I kind of just lumped on Sun Shui and Ma Zhou and um. The current leadership all under one because I don't know I I think I just see it all as one continuous I think the post the so called post democratic era like the, after the first transfer of power to the DPP has been just one more or less continuous um political era in Taiwan. What do you think? I mean I think it really is. I mean besides like some like you say some cosmetic changes the the overall uh, trajectory remained the same right. It's it's a uh, uh, you know, decinification in identity politics and, and yes. also the continuation of neoliberal politics, right? And then, um, the, you know, the, the, the people in Taiwan, all the structural problems in Taiwan is not addressed. I mean, because the structural problem in Taiwan was uh, 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 effect, after effect of uh, neoliberalism, uh, economics and politics that, that, that have been in place since early 90s and yes and it's 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 a it's a model that was championed by u.s right and and, Mm -hmm. and which 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 taiwan takes a lead from um and 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 people 
like like you say, you know, people are not really. It seems like people are kind of shielded from the fact that that you know maybe the problem is the global capitalism that was pioneered by by the U.S. Uh, instead, they they project everything to a more convenient scapegoat. Uh, you know, mainland China because for fifty years, uh, you know, over fifty years, mainland China was painted. As the Cold War enemy, right? I mean, it's it's yes. just a lot easier to go with that inertia and to just uh, you know re- reposition um, reposition it as, as the enemy of the new era, right? Like well, whatever whatever yields, uh, you know, Taiwan face can all be blamed on this uh, big bad in some way, even abstract mainland China because. Like the the way a lot of the Taiwan people talk about mainland, because you know, the, right now uh, in the internet age, you know, a lot of uh, <laughs> mainland people can get on the internet and, and watch like Taiwan variety shows, right? And and a lot of uh, main, it became like a kind of butt of uh, the joke on mainland, like how uh, the way that you know Taiwan talk, uh, like a lot of the Taiwan talk show hosts talk about mainland as this still very backward place where you know people can't afford to eat the uh, tie dan right the tea eggs <laughs> and, and that became like an internet meme on on mainland social media it's it's kind of like the um you know despite the proximity of taiwan to mainland and despite hundreds of thousands of taiwanese who work and travel to mainland china i think there's still a, a Overall, the middle class in Taiwan, they, they I think they understand U.S. better than they understand China. You know what? Do they though? Because I mean, if you talk to them about things like um, labor movements were suppressed, you talk about like Operation Mockingbird, you talk about a lot of stuff, and they don't know about that. They, I think what they I mean, understand the U.S. that the average middle class, they understand the U.S. They understand is also the U.S. that a lot of middle class Americans think the U.S. is. Yes, they understand U.S. as it is presented in the U.S. pop culture in the U.S. Yes, yes, yes. media because that's what's been consumed in Taiwan, right? Because yes, the, the the U.S. cultural hegemony and and soft power is so overwhelming um, that 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 becomes uh, like the norm, right? That that's that, that's that's why like any kind of threat to to that kind of existence that people feel. Um, you know, whereas mainland China is, is seem as almost like this alien regime that, you know, where a lot of fucked up things happen. <laughs> that that's a threat. Basically, yeah. and I think, um, interestingly, you know how like the DPP presents itself as anything but the KMT. Like, oh, we're like the opposite of the KMT. The KMT in the past was dictatorial. We're about pro- we're about progress. We're about democracy. But if you look at the relations between um, Taiwan, which is under DPP administration now, and the U.S., we're seeing a return to kind of almost like kind of like Jiang Jiaxi era in some ways. Because what happened um, when the U when the U.S. Um, cut ties with the Taipei government in favor of the Beijing government, it got rid of troops stationed in Taiwan. It, you know, but now as the new Cold War is you know, revving up. As you mentioned last time we did the Li Donghui episode, you know, you we're hearing through the grapevines how may- maybe the U.S. is kind of trying to ch- change things again. And which brings me back to the main point. It's like, yeah, the, maybe there is cosmetic differences between um, the DPP, but if you don't link this all with international politics and global developments and, um, you know, Sino, the overall Sino-U.S. relations... Then you're missing the then you're missing the point. I mean, what role does Taiwan play under this neoliberal order of things and under U.S. imperialism? That's the question that um it's the, it's never confronted directly in Taiwan because if you speak of imperialism, they'll um think of you as crazy and how it's just some crazy conspiracy theory. A lot of a lot of the liberals are like that. Yeah, because it's so normalized, right? Yes. It's a, they consume the U.S. media, they consume U.S. pop culture. It, that that just seems normal to 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 them. And 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 the fact that they also physically remove from U.S. society, so they're not aware of uh, like the 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 real in real life U.S. that existed outside of pop culture, outside you know MTV, uh, outside of uh, uh, you know Instagram or or or. Um, 
um, <laughs> U.S. TV soap opera or Friends, right? So people, people. I don't think I don't think Friends is popular, but um, Stranger Things was pretty popular in um in Taiwan. And I'm just like, God damn it. <laughs> yeah. And um, I mean everything. Netflix is available in Taiwan now, and a lot of the shows are subtitled. And most and all the shows are subtitled in Chinese. Interestingly, most of the subtitles come from mainland China. What they do is they just find the subtitles. Netflix just kind of finds the subtitles that were done by fans in the mainland, like the unofficial subtitles, and then they just um do an auto translate into、um, traditional Chinese. No way! Wow. So, so they are actually skimping out on a、uh, paying、uh, translation service by just、uh, yeah. leveraging. <laughs> wow, I it, that that actually、um, off topic, but there, in mainland there's actually a large fan subbing community that、yeah. uh, translates like shows from over the world, not just the U.S. So another big source is Japan, right? And and、yeah. and they will will fan sub. I mean, even even. Bollywood, because I have seen the the new、uh, Mahabharat、uh, TV drama from India subtitled in Chinese on Billy Billy. So you know, <laughs> nice. The sometimes the subtitles are so bad though. Like when I was watching Orange Is the New Black with a friend in Taiwan, and then when when they talked about minor crime, as in like you know petty crime, it got translated to、um, 少年犯罪 Ah,、uh, minor yeah, yeah. as in like minor under like under the age of eighteen or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I, again, you know, it's kind of lack. There's still a lack of fam- familiarity with like the, the 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 U.S. itself. I think that that shows. Yeah. Yeah. So what else? Um, what, what do you think? Um, we should get to now because I think we kind of touched um touched on all of the points post two thousand. Because I I don't know. I just feel I just feel that um ever I feel like Li Donghui. Lee Dong Hui's political legacy is the current status quo, and everything that was meant for this episode was kind of meant with, was kind of just said in that impromptu episode, and then yeah. Yeah, let's get to.、Uh, can we get to Tsai Ing Wen, right? Because we already talked about Ma Ying. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I forgot. I just kind of assumed that people would know. Basically, after the end of um, after the that's pretty much where we are now. After the Sunflower Movement under Ma Ying Zhou, you know, like we said, all of this whole um. Anti-China hysteria and、um, just dissatisfaction with neoliberalism and、um, stagnant and even、um, degrading quality of life. You know, people just were through with the KMT. So, Taiwan won pretty won by、um, what is it? Liu Baojiu is it Liu Baojiu won? She won by six point eight nine million votes in two thousand sixteen. Yeah, six point eight nine million. So that was on fifty. She won by sixty fifty six percent of the vote. Zhu Lilun, her KMT opponent, only got thirty one percent of the vote. The、That、reverse is- of two thousand eight. People in two thousand eight, people were people were fed up with Chen Shui Bian because they were like, yeah, you know, our quality of life isn't better. We we want change. And then Mind Joe steps up, and then he does. He increases bilateral trade with the mainland. But then people are now worried about the um the the China threat. And being, being swallowed by mainland China. So, and then you have stuff like the um the um 2014 umbrella movement in Hong Kong, plus the Sunflower Movement, and all that stuff. People want to change, so they got the DPP. They got um, Tsai Ing-wen into power. Right. So, so that's that's where we're today. And and um and can you just talk about you know any changes Tsai Ing-wen um brought、uh, once she is in power? I mean, when she was campaigning, she was talking about all these worker rights and stuff. But then, as soon as she got into power, not too long after she got into power, she was like doing things like、um, cutting down their vacations and all that stuff. I mean, you look at you look at like, for example, the what is it, the 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 flight attendant strikes and some other other strikes that happened, and the working class people were still being fucked over by her. But she's yeah, but she's what- progressive, so that's so that's okay. Yeah, one thing DPP does very well is they talk a good game. They 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 master all the rhetorics of you know like the the progressive、um, politics talk. But but that's、mm-hmm. what it is. It's just just talk. And then once once they're actually empowered, they're not very different from 
you know, the KMT they, they're opposed to. It's a, it's a theme we, we, we keep on returning to is that, you know, basically the it, it's it's two parties, but this really is the same politics. Yes. But I think um, Tsai Ing-wen is more, I don't know, I don't really like talking about these hypotheticals, so maybe I'm not going to say, but like right now, I mean, I remember when Trump first got elected, you know, every people in Taiwan were like, oh, like, how could that be? This is really bad. But then now it's like, now it's just like, it's apparent that whoever becomes U.S. president is um, is the boss of Taiwan. Because nowadays you look at, you, you look at attitudes towards Trump, not necessarily by the Taiwanese people, but by, you know, the Taiwan administration, same thing. You know, okay, yeah, it's, we're going to listen to them. We're going to procure arms. We're going to do everything they tell us to. Only The only way the DPP really gets support in the long run is if there is a China threat or what they call the China threat. And now with um, with um, with contradictions between the U.S. and China increasing, this kind of helps the DPP because the DPP can start posturing as like the defenders of Taiwanese sovereignty. But then when it comes to like, but then it, but then it's like um, hardliners are still kind of unhappy with Taiwan because you know, like for example the. The so-called vice president now, um, Lai Qingde, he used to describe himself as a, a Taiwan independence worker. Now, Taiwan independence means that you are against the so-called Republic of China. But then now they're just like kind of dodging the question. So they're just like, no, we are an independent country and we're called the Republic of China. So this kind of they're using the, the so-called Republic of China as this sort of like protective umbrella. It's It, it means whatever they want it to mean, but that's... That's funnily enough. That's against the constitution because the constitution is still a one China constitution. Republic of China is the mainland plus Taiwan, not one or the other. I mean, this not that this really matters, but what I'm saying is this is just further evidence that their whole independence stuff is just it's just talk. But what's what's real is the fact that um they're maintaining the de facto separation the de facto cross-strait situation such that Taiwan can continue to serve U.S. Um, geopolitical interests in in the area. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely agree. So it's, oh, it's, but- it's kind of funny, though, because I see, um, I, I see like, Western... I, I saw this post on Twitter before I was kicked off, like, criticizing Tsai Ing-wen's um, policies. is saying it's like, like the... Rem- and they refer to um, her politics as um, remnants of the KMT. And I guess that's inaccurate, but in some other ways, it it still is accurate. And nowadays, I'm like maybe, maybe like the confusion among Westerners kind of makes sense because while we see the intricate, while we see the intricacies, overall, besides the subtle like branding differences and the identity politics differences, it's more or less the same. We got to You got to admit. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, it's just like. You know, the difference between Democrat Party and uh, the Republican Party nowadays. Um, and and the, uh, especially f- f- from someone who looked far, you know, across the Pacific, looking at Taiwan, it does. I mean, I mean also, you, you raise the fact that Tsai Ing-wen herself used to be part of the KMT bureaucracy, right, under Li Denghui. So. Yeah, and then Li Denghui <laughs> basically injected her into the DPP in, I believe, 2004. And it's funny because there's still a video of her um, speaking back then. Like, I think people, I think some of the KMT members were questioning her about her identity. And she was like, no, I'm Chinese. I grew up studying Chinese literature, so I, I'm Chinese. But yeah. that's not her rhetoric anymore. So you can see it. all this stuff is very malleable. It's just um, you say whatever makes people happy or whatever is, um, makes you seem ballsy enough. Yeah, and and also added to the to the other dimension, of course, is that they're just uh, also a great ignorance about uh, East Asia in general from U.S. Other than kind of the geopolitical interests, because there was um, yeah. the, like last year, twenty nineteen, Heritage, uh, Her- uh, you know, Heritage Foundation, you know, the the <laughs> U.S. conservative think tank, um, they invited uh, Tsai Ing-wen to speak remotely. And they um, there was a U.S. congressman from Florida, uh, Ted Yoho. Uh, I mean, he's not just any congressman. He was actually on the 
uh, I think on the foreign com uh, like the foreign relations committee for for East Asia, and I, I think he also oversees like the the arms uh, like the arms committee. Like so, he he's supposed to be like the the person in charge of East Asia in the U.S. Congress, basically. And mm -hmm. and he was brought on, and he he's uh, he he started to greet uh, Tsai Ing Wen. He said, uh, you know, uh, Pres President Tsai Ing Wen. First of all, just let me allow me to say, Anyang <laughs> Haseyo. But he said that. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> they, they it was so embarrassing. They they ended up removing that clip when they post the final footage to the Heritage Foundation. Um, uh, a YouTube video, but people still captured it, you know, from the li I guess from the live feed, and and I just saw this posting uh, by somebody on Twitter, so I, I reposted it on my Twitter of U.S. congressman doing Anyang Ha Seyo to uh, greeting Tsai Ing Wen, and and this actually reminds me of, uh, of another of my Chinese American friends. Uh, he said, uh, you know, BTS, the, the K-pop band, is actually the biggest win. For Chinese soft power, I'm like, wait, aren't they Korean? He said, well, you know, this is U.S. We're, we're talking about. They can't tell the difference. <laughs> <laughs> True. And I think uh, let's talk about the KMT through all of this. I mean, right now the KMT is just stuck in an awkward position. They lost in 2016 in the uh, so-called presidential election. They lost in 2020, and I think the 2020 um, loss was. Um, I think among more hardline supporters of the KMT, it was more shocking because they were convinced that um, they were going to do very well this it, year, it, earlier this year. It's reasonable to expect that because Tsai Ing-wen's approval rating was actually abysmal. At one point, it was sing single digits heading yeah. into the election. And, and yes. Well, As a, and, and I want to I want to talk about why this is. It's basically the same thing. The neoliberalism, people feeling that their lives aren't improving. So obviously, when your approval rating is that low, it means that people who voted for you are dissatisfied now, meaning that um, they feel that you didn't deliver on your promises. Hysteria comes in. You have the you got this. You got a new wave of Hong Kong protests that ha that started um, in the middle of last year. So up until then, um, the KMT with their candidate, um, Han Guoyu, they were pretty convinced that he would win. But at the same time, it's like, what was he promising other than, um, other than oh, prosperity for all? He was mayor of Kaohsiung, but then not, for, but then as not too long after he was elected mayor, he started running for the like the leader. So it's and then there was also like this sort of there's a high level of um like self-delusion among like more hardline supporters of the KMT because they would go to these KMT rallies and be like, oh, he's like revitalizing the whole like um, ROC identity because look at how all, like everyone at his rallies are waving the flags. And it's like, well, when you pass around flags at those rallies and people go and they're going to take them and what are you going to do with the flag when you get it? You're just going to wave it around, <laughs> right? <laughs> Cause like you have um you have like the more hardline hardline supporters they're like the super hardcore very vocal they're posting online all the time they have all of these like fan groups for him and like these anti Taiwan fan groups and I mean yeah I, I'm anti Taiwan too but I'm also not um for Han Guoyu I, I I did I did I was in Taiwan during the election I didn't vote just because I didn't see the point of voting but um yeah I um I have an uncle he's um very centrist like. Before, like back in the day, like I think he was a supporter of Peng Mingmin, and then, um, and, and then uh, he supported Chen Shui-bian, but then he supported Ma Ying-jeou. But then in 2016, he voted for Tsai Ing-wen, and now one of he says one of his biggest regrets was voting for her. And then earlier this year, um, he would he would like go to Han Guoyu's rallies and sh and shit, and just like support him. And it's not like he wasn't a hardcore supporter. All he said was. You know, um, just looking at politics now, you know, I've never experienced war in my lifetime. But it seems that with the trajectory that the DPP is taking us on, war seems like a like great possibility. And, you know, I guess there's a certain extent, but I don't think I, I, I don't think the DPP is the one in the driver's seat. That's that's the uh, United States. I mean, U U.S. ultimately is is in charge of how Taiwan re will react to, to mainland China. And I think we see um, more and more like U.S. kind of changing its position, especially under Donald Trump administration. 
you know, we had the Azar, uh, basically the the, the uh, Trump's uh, health. Um, what what is it? Health uh, health. He's a health uh, guy. Yeah, yeah, the health guy, the Trump's health guy, went to Taiwan. I mean, it's, it's the first time for for high level U.S. Uh, official to visit Taiwan in official capacity, and then. You know, immediately after that, uh, you know, not only Taiwan buy the, uh, the, 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 you know, F-16s, the latest F-16s from U.S., but also um, they just changed the passport, right? They just changed the, the passport of Taiwan. They removed the Republic of China. In- they didn't remove it. They, they, they shrunk it down so that it surrounds like the, um, the, the sun that's in the middle of the passport. Yes. So basically, it's more pro- Taiwan is made prominent. Whereas, but you have to. But for Western audience, you have to notice they they're not putting Taiwan in. They they don't write Taiwan at all on the passport in Chinese. Yes. Yes. So it's, it's Taiwan was added to the passport for the, for the first time under Chen Shui-bian. But even then, it was yep. never. It was only added in English, never in Chinese. Yeah, I mean, this it, it makes you know it's very carefully crafted message, right? I mean, it's, yeah, and, and I also like I think it's because it leads to the you know I remember the official reason for changing it under Chen Shui Bian era was that people complain like they get mistaken from you know Chinese from mainland China, right? Which they didn't want to be associated with because. Mainland China is seeing as this poor backward place, you know. They not are- just that. Another more legitimate thing is there's different visa requirements for different, like, with the two passports. And sometimes yes. if you get confused, then it's it's a pain in the ass to deal with sometimes. But um, I think that excuse was just there for plausible deniability. I don't think that was the main reason at all. Yeah, yeah. But at least it's it's plausible. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's uh, until um un- until the people in Taiwan realize that the ma- uh, one of the main contradictions in the world today is U.S. imperialism. There's you're just gonna be um walking to all these dead ends. I mean, right now, like with the whole attitude with the um with the Zen thing, it's just oh, see, like this is this is why Taiwan is great because we're being um um we're being valued by the U.S. Basically, um. Uh, the uh, liberals in Taiwan, like the middle class liberals, like other people, like the poor people don't give a fuck about this. But like um, with the more um, like middle class liberals, all they want is for like they really care about what the first world and like the the, the um, so-called international community, basically meaning the Western world thinks about Taiwan. And they just want the they just want like the Western advanced capitalist countries to recognize Taiwan's existence. Like they get so happy. Like I remember, like on on this hip hop forum in Taiwan, how like like maybe like ten years ago, eleven years ago, there was this Nicki Minaj song, and she mentions Taiwan in one of her lyrics, and people were all were so happy just by the mere mention of it. And I'm just like, and they're always talking about, oh, we want um we want the dignity for Taiwanese. And I'm just like, well, if you're just constantly drooling every time some Westerner acknowledges your existence, how is that dignity at all? And it's like, why do you? care about care so much about what these um peop- countries of the imperial core think about you when really you should be standing with the with, with the world's oppressed peoples it's really funny because like in, in, in these circumstances time will be like well you know actually we understand what it's like to be oppressed because we're oppressed by china because we're not allowed to join um international we're not allowed to join international organizations under our name and just like Okay, that's that's a very shitty metric because um, I, I I think I mentioned this in previous episodes. Yeah, sure, Taiwan cannot enter the Olympics under its own name, and it's not a recognized um, country by by the United Nations. Whereas, but the thing is, like, you look at Cuba. Cuba is recognized in the UN, and it can participate in the Olympics under its own name. But can you really argue that Taiwan is more isolated? On the inter- on an international scale than Cuba is. That's a good point. Because even I... though formal relations don't exist, informal relations still do. And in fact, informal relations sometimes are even are are like special relations almost. I feel because they're not subject to the same um same protocol. That's why like the U.S. can basically with um. With its Taiwan policy, it can just do whatever the fuck it wants with Taiwan. 
and doesn't have to be responsible at all. And then they can paint um, China out to be the one that's being irrational, even though, um, I mean, you don't have to agree with this view, but the fact that the, y- you can be for independence or whatever, but you, def- you can't deny the fact that um, Taiwan is recognized by the world as an integral part of China. It's just that it hasn't been administered directly by the PRC government yet. But that's the thing, right? I mean, that a lot of people don't want that kind of association with mainland China because that feel that somehow um, degrade their status, right? Like their their, their status as a, as a U.S. ally, as a you know like a quote unquote democracy, uh, as a, as a country that that enjoy higher um, standard of living, and like it, it's like a very petty bourgeois thing to care about. It's very, uh, very, very. Yeah. So that's pretty much the state of politics in Taiwan today. I think um, I think if people listen to all of our previous episodes, I think now they total up to, what, like 14, 15 hours? Something like that. Yeah. Then, yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's it provides a better context of why things are this way. But unfortunately, it's also a pretty anticlimactic, anticlimactic ending, I feel, because I feel that like earlier when you had like, you know, for example, the Korean War going on and the ret- and the KMT's retreat to Taiwan and like all of the um, interactions, the, the triangular relationship between the KMT, this, uh, the CPC and the United States, that was a lot more exciting. But now it's just like, well, it's just kind of the stuff we see in the news. It's it's a slow decay under neoliberalism, right? I mean, the same kind of uh, process that's going on in more developed uh, Western society as well. I think people yeah. can relate to. Uh, I feel yeah. like today's episode, I was um a little bit more um I, I was a little bit less prepared. Admittedly, I just been dealing with a lot of um just a lot of stuff on my end. But also, and, and I'm, I wasn't as well prepared as I was for my previous episodes. But also, it's just um. I think it's an accurate reflection of the state and the overall mood of everything in Taiwan. It's just kind of like, yeah, we're just going through the motions, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I you know, I actually, I think you said this, and I also I said this before the latest Taiwan election, that I actually wish for a Tsai ing uh, election victory because... <laughs> I don't see um, Taiwan pulling itself out of its economic morasses uh, uh, at this current rate, right? I mean, the Taiwan mm-hmm. is so embedded to this neoliberal narrative um, and structure that there's not even any attempt to to strike off or something different. So what we're going to look at is the, the continued decline, the continued uh, ferment of discontent, um, and the, continued- the rise of fascism. Yes, the continual uh, uh, play of identity politics to distract people from the real issue uh, of the economy, of the global capitalism, of U.S. imperialism. And, and, and now we are actually entering a more uncharted territory because, like I said, U.S. is switching gears to wage a Cold War on China. Taiwan, once again, is on the on the front front line so to speak and to i want to say this on record so mark my words i keep on saying this and um, i think for i think the western audience has a dif- has some difficulty understanding this but fascism is on the rise in taiwan just like it is in min- min- in everywhere that's experiencing like everything we've described like the sort of like like capitalist crisis like neoliberal the the dying neoliberalism and um, the declining um, standards of living. But the fascism that's going to... um, Fascism isn't going to be like in the U.S. where it's like overtly, you know, rightist and overtly like racist, overtly like, you know, like homophobic, this, that. No, it's going to it's going to have a progressive veneer in Taiwan, as you can see, because, um, yeah. You look at the populists, the like the left, right, the the center left, and the right populists in Taiwan. They're it's it's interesting. It's 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 fascism of the with pseudo progressive characteristics. I think just that, think of just think of Maiden 
and um all of the color revolutions look at look at um figures like um like um Joshua Wong and um who else like the whole the whole China watcher crowd it's pretty much like that yeah i mean one thing i i said this before one thing that the you know us three letter us agencies have figured out uh, very successfully is that they have learned post cold war to adopt a lot of uh you know, anti-imperialist, anti-colonial, and anti-capitalism rhetoric, right? From package that in in like kind of the progressive talk, but uh, yes, end, that's the push, DPP exactly. Yeah, and and in the end, still pushing the U.S. imperialist agenda. <laughs> you know, now 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 we just have uh, you know we can have LGBT uh, bomber pilots. You know. <laughs> You know, LGBT uh, uh, drone pilots who are droning the, you know, the, the people in Middle East. So, so that's 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 what's count as progress nowadays. Yes, and what else? Uh, y- 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 after you said all that, I thought of something, but I um, I lost my train of thought. With um, <laughs> okay. it has to do with tie- it has to do with Tai Wen's leadership and her um, what is it? What is it? Oh, oh yeah. Um, the, all the stuff like all all the pro U.S. like crowd, and, and like her supporters, they they support her under a lot of them support her under the banner of, um, of decolonization. Yes, yes. So to them, the colonizer, the colonizer is not Japan. It's not the U.S. or 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 it was at one point Japan, but that that's in the past, and uh, all's all's good now. But it's um. Their their take the um the 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 more hardline separatist in Taiwan, and I'm not saying that most Taiwan supporters are hardliners, but they they make a they are a they they are a faction, and they do kind of um sort of hold some political sway. Um, their 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 take is Taiwan has been a Chinese colony since 1945. Yeah, yeah, and and there was uh you know there there's also that um kind of rewriting of the history right how how Taiwan is always um there's like a they 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 re, they celebrate rewriting of Taiwan's history under the guise of celebrating diversity right and then like yes Taiwan has always been a, a diverse place of of uh, coming together of many cultures right and yeah we we have dutch influence we have portuguese influence we have chinese influence we have japanese influence we even have some spanish influence when they um call on, when, when they like set up a colony in the north it's like no that's not that's not how that's not how colonization that's not how colonialism works okay yeah i mean even more gross is there's even adopt they co-opt indigenous culture as nothing i mean if anything i'm all for celebration of indigenous culture in taiwan right indigenous community have been marginalized in taiwan for so long yes. but what dpp is doing is is just adopting the kind of the aesthetics of like indigenous culture um as kind of like a branding of, of Taiwan as a, as a separate place. But, but, but in, in real life, they're not doing anything for the indigenous community, right? You know, they're, they're just screwing them over as they have always done. And the indigenous community knows that. If, have you seen the 2020 election map in Taiwan? Uh-huh. No, no, not yet. Oh, no. you got to look at that. You had to look at that map. Look at the areas where the DPP won and the KMT. So it's like, you know, green and blue, whatever. And then compare that to the first maps of Taiwan from the Qing dynasty because during the earlier when Taiwan was was first incorporated into the Qing dynasty um only the areas populated by Han Chinese were um like considered under like Qing administration yeah so um, it's like y- y- you know what map I'm talking about right yeah it's a 19th century uh, map of Taiwan where like the most Han uh, Chinese settlement were on the west coast you know on the plain so basically the mountains and the east are not part of that map yes now look at okay that's basically the 2020 election map that's basically the areas that dpp won like the mountains and like um like 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 hualien taidong yeah they're 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 still blue and it's not that they it's not that the 
the um, indigenous people are like super enthusiastic about the KMT. It's just the, to them, the way they're thinking is, well, they're both going to fuck us over, but at least the KMT has um, the decency to buy our votes. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, pragmatism. Pragmatism. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this this I think we, we did a good job deconstruct uh, the Taiwan society today. Um, like I think this is uh, going to be the conclusion of our of our Taiwan political history series. Um, mm-hmm. You know, until until for pending further development, right? <laughs> I think from now on it will just be like we can talk about individual issues as they pop up that we want to talk about. Yes, yes, I think yeah. we give a pretty good context, um, so we can now we have like a better historical context for people to have intelligent conversations about Taiwan. And that's what we set out to do in the beginning. Um, but we mm-hmm. do have some other plans. Uh, you want to talk about that? Yeah, um, well, you know, what? Funny, funnily enough, I'm not sure if the hip hop episode can, um, I'm not sure when we can do that, because um, that friend, he's working in mainland China now. So I'm not sure um, what his schedule was like yet. I'll still talk to him. We can probably work something out. But um yeah we we were talking about I have a friend who wrote his um he wrote his um thesis on um like imperialism and how um what is it and the commodification okay. of culture and how that relates to um hip hop and how not just like hip hop's development not just in the US but how it spread throughout the rest of the world and also into like the sinosphere since um Taiwan did play a pretty important role in Chinese hip hop since it was one of the first places where um, Mandarin rap became widespread. And now, especially after 2017, when um, rap in China, this um, mainland Chinese um, show came out, it's like gotten pretty mainstream. So it's, we thought about talking about, you know, just some of the stuff that he wrote in his thesis and also um, developments in, um, you know, hip hop in not not just in Taiwan, but the the um the Chinese speaking world, which includes mainland China. But I, I imagine there will be some Chinese there there will be there will be some focus on Taiwan. You know, with um some of the earlier pioneers and how um, some of them turned out to be pieces of shit, like that one guy. Yeah, I hopefully that can uh, come through because I was really looking forward to do that show with you and your friend. Um, but, you know, I'll, um, I'll have to do some prep work because I, I still need to, um, he had this presentation and I want to, um, just kind of have, I, I want to, um, translate some of the stuff that he said and just get an overall rundown. And then, um, after that, I was thinking we were, we were talking about, um, doing a, um, series on the war to resist America, American imperialism and aid Korea. Yes, which is um not just the it's part of the Korean War um the or um the war to resist U.S. imperialism in a Korea that's like the U.S. that's the English translation of Kangmei Yuan Chao. Kangmei Yuan Chao and the Korean War are not exactly the same. Kangmei Yuan Chao refers to the Chinese involvement in the war. So I th- we'll, I think we'll be more focusing more on um the developments in China in the times leading up to the Korean War during and after it, and maybe some of the battles and some of the political implications, but we'll all, but inevitably we'll also be getting into some of um the um some of the history of the Korean War from a Korean perspective, but that won't be the major focus. And I guess maybe somewhere in there we might talk a little bit about some of my family when that happened. Believe it or not, I have some I have some relatives who were born in North Korea, so yeah, I, I really look forward to that. And and basically, you will be just retelling of the Korean War from the Chinese perspective. Um, and and I, I, uh, I'm pretty psyched, actually, uh, about this. Like, we, we, we actually don't have to hold, that, hold off that series um, until the hip hop series. I mean, like... I know, we- but I need to do a lot of prep work. <laughs> okay. I mean, we, we can just... I don't know. I, I feel like a lot of what we do is just like having a conversation. And I think there's, there's probably already what we already know that it's not publicly or why. I know, but I want to make it more interesting because I've read some interesting stuff. It's just I read so much interesting stuff that I can't recall all of it. Okay. Well, I mean, you don't so have I, I want I, I want to just get my thoughts organized. 
Okay, okay, but 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 remember, like I I'm here to help you too, because I I'm uh, yeah. This is this this is like kind of my cup of tea here. So, so nice. I, so I'll yeah. show you actually. There was a CCTV documentary that I really liked. I think I'll show it to you sometime or send you a link okay. that should be required watching before we do the series. Okay, sounds good. I actually I do plan to do like a like a Chinese Civil War series. I I, I uh -huh. wanted to. I wanted to do, uh, but I wanted to break it down by different theaters. Um, like I wanted to, uh, I'm, I was trying to, I wanted to do first do a, do like a series maybe on the, on the, um, the, 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 the Manchuria theater in Dongbei, right? North. Uh -huh, yeah. Because that, 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 that area is sufficiently standalone. Um, you know, can, can be talked about uh, as in isolation from, from the other parts of China. And and it's it's a it's a also another like a topic that's very little talk about in English language medium. Mm -hmm. uh, like how many people in America know about Zhang Xueliang? Oh yeah, exactly, exactly right. Um, and and even oh, last... and um, the good thing about that that's related to this is um, pe after people listen to that, they'll stop saying things like oh, Taiwan started the Chinese Civil War. Right, 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 right. Because, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can say the KMT started it, but, um, I mean, when, when the Chinese Civil War started, Taiwan was a Japanese colony. It didn't really have much to do with um, the power struggles between Chiang Kai-shek and, uh, and the communists. Yep, yeah. So, yeah, just wanted to throw that out there since um, I keep on seeing these stupid takes. Well, that's, that's, our, that's why it's our job to educate. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's why I don't respond to them anymore. Um, I, I, I respond to some, but I try to be polite and try yeah. to point people towards our series. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Let's do that. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, look, uh, so, so this is great. I mean, like, w I think we can um, call it a wrap for today. Um, uh -huh. like, but you guys can look forward to all the new exciting stuff coming down the pipeline. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you everybody uh, who tuned in to lesson and until next time. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, that's great. Uh, Wait, let me press the stop recording board. button. Yeah. Wait, where is the button? Oh.